So most of what people consider to be long distance trips uh, would be completed in less than half an hour. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk envisions point-to-point -point space travel will completely replace flights as the preferred means of passenger travel. A plane ride from New York City to Shanghai is currently about 15 hours, and it could be as long as 29 hours with connecting flights. With point-to-point -point travel, SpaceX says you could get there in less than an hour. Will this happen? A reusable rocket definitely needs a landing pad, and in the case of SpaceX Starship, it's the giant monster Mechazilla. Can SpaceX build all these giant constructions as much as airports around the world? Or is it really unlikely in this century, right? But as it turns out, Elon Musk has a genius solution for this. Marine recovery systems for the Starship program. Much simpler to put into practice. So how will it happen? Well, why is this an amazing idea for SpaceX? Let's find out more in today's episode of the Alpha Tech Channel. Since SpaceX first began bending metal for its steel Starship development program in late 2018, CEO Elon Musk, executives, and the company itself have long maintained that both Super Heavy boosters and Starship upper stages would perform what is known as Return to Launch Site, or RTLS, landings. It's no longer clear if those stated plans are set in stone. Notably, in a series of new job postings, SpaceX has hinted at an unexpected desire to develop marine recovery systems for the Starship program. Oddly, despite repeatedly revealing plans to develop marine recovery assets for Starship, SpaceX's recent marine engineer and naval architect job postings never specifically mentioned the company's well-established plans to convert retired oil rigs into vast floating Starship launch sites. Weighing several thousand tons and absolutely dwarfing the football field-sized drone ship SpaceX recovers Falcon boosters with, it goes without saying that towing an entire oil rig hundreds of miles to and from port is not an efficient or economical solution for rocket recovery. It also would make very little sense for SpaceX to hire a dedicated naval architect without once mentioning that they'd be working on something as all-encompassing as the world's largest floating launch pad. That leaves us three obvious explanations for the mentions. First, it might be possible that SpaceX is merely preparing for the potential recovery of debris or intact floating ships or boosters after intentionally expending them on early orbital Starship test flights. Second, SpaceX might have plans to strip an oil rig or two without fully converting them into launch pads, and then use those rigs as landing platforms designed to remain at sea indefinitely. Those platforms then might transfer landed ships or boosters to smaller support ships, tasked with returning them to dry land. Third, and arguably most likely, SpaceX might be exploring the possible benefits of landing super heavy boosters at sea. In fact, it's an extremely efficient solution for SpaceX. Through its Falcon rocket, SpaceX has slowly but surely refined and perfected the recovery and reuse of orbital class rocket boosters, which occurred back on land. Rather than coasting 500 to 1,000 kilometers downrange after stage separation and landing on a drone ship at sea, those boosters flipped around, canceled out their substantial velocities, and boosted themselves a few hundred kilometers back to the Florida or California coast, where they finally touched down on a basic concrete pad. Unsurprisingly, canceling out around 1.5 kilometers per second of downrange velocity, equivalent to Mach more or less 4.5, and fully reversing that velocity back toward the launch site is an expensive maneuver, costing quite a lot of propellant. For example, the nominal 25-second re-entry burn performed by almost all Falcon boosters likely cost about 20 tons of propellant. The average more or less 35-second single-engine landing burn used by all Falcon boosters likely cost about 10 tons of propellant. Normally, that's all that's needed for a drone ship booster landing. And for RTLS landings, Falcon boosters must also perform a large, more or less 40-second boost back burn with three Merlin ID engines, likely costing an extra 25 to 35 tons of propellant. In other words, an RTLS landing generally ends up costing at least twice as much propellant as a drone ship landing. Using the general rocketry rule of thumb that every seven kilograms of booster mass reduces payload to orbit by one kilogram, and assuming that each reusable Falcon booster requires about three tons of recovery-specific hardware, mostly legs and grid fins, a drone ship landing might reduce Falcon 9's payload to low Earth orbit, LEO, by around five tons, from 22 tons to 17 tons. 
The extra propellant needed for an RTLS landing might reduce it by another 4 to 5 tons to 13 tons. This is all to say that landing reusable boosters at sea will always likely be substantially more efficient. Nevertheless, there's one drawback to this approach. Landing and recovering giant rocket boosters at sea is inherently difficult, risky, time-consuming, and expensive. That makes rapid reuse on the order of multiple times per day or week almost impossible and inevitably adds the cost of recovery, which could actually be quite significant for a rocket that SpaceX wants to eventually cost just a few million dollars per launch. However, so long as at-sea recovery cost is less than a few million dollars, there's always a chance that certain launch profiles could be drastically simplified and end up cheaper by the occasional at-sea booster landing. If the alternative is a second dedicated launch to partially refuel one Starship, it's possible that a sea landing could give Starship the performance needed to accomplish the same mission in a single launch, lowering the total cost of launch services. If, like with Falcon 9, a sea landing could boost Starship's payload to LEO by a third or more, the regular sea recovery of Super Heavy boosters would also necessarily cut the number of launches SpaceX needs to fill up a Starship moon lander by a third. Given that SpaceX and NASA have been planning for Starship tanker launches to occur about 12 days apart, recovering boosters at sea becomes even more feasible. In theory, the Starship launch vehicle CEO Elon Musk has recently described could be capable of launching anywhere from 150 to 200 plus tons to low Earth orbit with full reuse and RTLS booster recovery. With so much performance available, it may matter less than it does with Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy if an RTLS booster landing cuts the payload to orbit by a third, a half, or even more. And at the end of the day, just 100 tons to LEO may be more than enough to satisfy any realistic near-term performance requirements. Granted, this is all speculation at this point, but one cannot deny it's an exciting prospect. Despite that, even if SpaceX is ready to implement the new plan, the Starship itself will not yet meet the frequency of such flights. Of course, even if Starships and Super Heavy boosters are ready enough for marginally routine launches of up to multiple times a week, let alone per day, with launch cost having been slashed to only several millions of dollars, it's hard to imagine SpaceX willingly leaving so much performance of RTLS on the table by forgoing at-sea recovery out of principle alone. Thus, as with most things, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget, share your ideas in the comments section. Your support is motivation for us to create more quality content. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.